Okay, so the um, the term gifted children is somewhat vague, and um, I mean, I think a similar article could have been written on sort of outlier kids in any number of domains. I, I ended up focusing on intellectual achievement specifically, which is usually where the term uh, gifted children is is utilized. And the, uh, the interesting thing that I found is, the, is that this field of gifted education and uh, research on gifted children is actually fairly new. Um, th there have obviously been child prodigies and outlier uh, achievement among children for, for a long time. But, but as a field of study and a field of genuine inquiry, uh, it really didn't begin until the early 20th century. And um, a, a major pioneer in the field was a Stanford psychologist by the name of Lewis Terman. And if you've heard that name, it's probably um, if you've read Malcolm Gladwell's book, Outliers, which features uh, Terman's research. And I, I think uh, Gladwell's account of, of Terman is a bit misleading for, for reasons I'll get into. Um, but basically, beginning in, in the 1910s, uh, Terman, who by now was a, a prominent public intellectual, became interested in intellectually talented children and he, he did go into it, although as a serious scholar, also with a, sort of an ideological agenda. And he, he went into the research with sort of a suspicion that sort of the prevailing stereotype of highly intelligent children as being sort of feeble, weak, misfits was off base, and that intellectually talented children were actually uh, not only physically and emotionally healthy, but also that they had uh, an enormous amount of potential that could be tapped. And, um, and so one of the interesting things with Terman is that at the time when he began his research on intellectually uh, talented children, IQ tests were, were around, but they really were untested and not really utilized uh, by American academics. But, but Terman maintained that IQ, as he put it, was one of the most important facts that can be learned about any child. And so what, what Terman did was that he identified uh, over 1,000 children uh, who had an average IQ of around 150. Um, and, and just by, you know, to put 150 in context, um, the, the average IQ in the U.S. is 100. And if you're above 120, you're in a, a very high uh, sort of cognitive elite or echelon. So, so 150 is, is very high. And, um, and he basically sort of recruited them for an uh, ongoing longitudinal study that, that uh, was sort of not only a pioneering study, but remains one of the, the most uh, uh, sort of ongoing or, 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 or sort of longstanding uh, studies of, of this sort. Um, another, another scholar who I think has, has not actually received the attention uh, she deserves is a Columbia psychologist by the name of uh, Lita Hollingworth, and um, uh, Hollingworth is interesting because I mean, she she sort of coined this term, gift, the gifted child movement, um, and and her research really focused on children above 133. Although toward the, the end of her career, she focused on children with an IQ above 180, um, which again, is just extraordinarily high. Uh, when I was doing the research on this piece, but by one estimate, the average IQ of a white or Asian student at MIT is 138. So these are kids sort of significantly above even this level of achievement. And, and Hollingworth, again, was sort of a, a pioneer in the field because one of the ways that she did research here uh, is, is basically by using uh, above age and above grade level testing. So, so basically, you know, she, she would take these kids at a very young age and give them uh, standardized tests that, that were typically used for high school students or even adults. And, and this is kind of, um, that, that laid the groundwork for sort of more recent uh, research uh, today, which is done. Uh, one of the ways, for example, that gifted children are, are identified today is that they're sort of weeded out, they're basically given the SAT uh, in middle school, and those who, are, who score at the very top are, are identified as gifted, talented children, and there, there are some programs available for them. 
I mean, one of the things, sort of the criticisms that I might uh, level against the, the uh, Gladwell interpretation of Terman, Gladwell basically sort of used the work of Lewis Terman to, to argue that, kind of the, to, to make the case against this idea of raw intellect or raw, ta raw innate ability as being uh, all that relevant. And basically, what, sort of the, the charge that he levels against Terman is that Terman went into this field kind of not only with the intent of recruiting these sort of highly intelligent, high IQ kids, but also sort of really with the hope that this sample of kids would, would tur turn out to produce sort of real outlier achievement and Nobel Prize winners and whatnot. And, and one of the sort of criticisms of the Terman study was that he actually missed in the course of his preliminary vetting, uh, I believe two future Nobel Prize winners uh, and, and several other notable people. And this is kind of used as a, a criticism not only of Terman, but also IQ tests. I mean, I, I think what that sort of critique does not acknowledge is two things. One, that Terman was a very, very early uh, user of IQ tests, and, and the sophistication of IQ tests today are, uh, are, are much better than they were back, back then. And, and I think even sort of William Shockley, who was one of the people uh, who was missed, and, and, and some of the other sort of notable people probably would have been identified using today's uh, testing ability because sort of they, they can account for people who have much higher quantitative abilities than, than verbal ones. So I mean, that's sort of one critique of the, uh, of the Glad Malcolm Gladwell account of the Terman research. But the other is that even though uh, it's true that many of the, the sort of the people in the Terman study did not go on to have outlier uh, achievement per se. Uh, they did achieve in adulthood academic and financial achievements at rates that were considerably higher than the national average. Uh, so, and, um, and also actually in, in the realm of sort of health and, and mental health and emotional health, uh, Terman was uh, more or less correct that kind of prevailing stereotypes about gifted children were uh, largely off base. So for, for reasons I'll get into, the, the kind of field of study on giftedness uh, is still very much in its infancy, and, um, and, and sort of the very definition of giftedness, even in the intellectual realm, uh, remains a, a matter of debate among experts. And um, th there are some people who really emphasize IQ and, and its relevance and pertinence, uh, but there are other sort of developmental psychologists who propose kind of different theories that take into account multiple types of intelligence. So that's sort of an ongoing debate in the field. But what I found is IQ, whatever its criticisms, is sort of a, a fairly good measure of general intelligence, and it's probably the best that we have, at least right now. So, so based on IQ and other sort of measures of general intelligence, I, I sort of looked through the literature and I found that I found a number of sort of generalizations about uh, gifted children, at least in the United States, and I'll, I'll just run through them. One is that they inherit at least some of their cognitive edge or ability, and there's some debate sort of in the, among academics on uh, precisely how much intelligence is hereditary and part how much it's environmental. I don't think there's any clarity on the subject, but I think there is more or less a consensus that uh, not only some, but a very high percentage of, of intelligence is inherited. Uh, and, and that sort of the longer you go on, that there are limits on how much it can be manipulated. Second, that, that children can, can lose IQ points uh, through various environmental output, or inputs. Uh, some of the things that have been linked to reductions in IQ are uh, corporal punishment, disease, formula feeding, scheduled rather than on-demand breastfeeding and secondhand smoke. And then on the other side, in terms of how to sort of cultivate and nourish uh, IQ uh, through environmental nourishment, uh, the two most imp important factors seem to be uh, material provision and parental involvement. Now, in the US, gifted children are overrepresented in certain ethnic and racial groups. The main groups that tend to be overrepresented are uh, Indian Americans, Jewish Americans, but particularly Ashkenazi Jews and Northeast Asians, uh, as opposed to Southeast Asians. There is a pretty marked uh, difference between the two groups. 
Uh, there are also a number of behavioral sort of differences in gifted children. Uh, gifted children tend to have a very high capacity to feel empathy. Uh, and they also tend to be uh, very sexually conservative sort of throughout their, their childhood and into adulthood. Um, and, and related to that is that they, they tend to have unique emotional vulnerabilities. Uh, for example, alienation, uh, intense sensitivity, and perfectionism. Uh, another sort of factor on the behavioral side is that they, what, what sort of makes gifted children unique uh, is basically this kind of unusual combination of, on the one hand, superior intelligence, but on the other hand, emotional immaturity. So, so for example, like one of the things that you, you find with gifted children that's very confusing to adults is that you may have sort of a child talking about math or, or playing the piano or something at a, at a very high level. Uh, but they, they don't really have a, the sense of how, how unusual this is, and then sort of they might play like a, a piano concerto or something one minute and then play in a sandbox or something. And, uh, or, or like another way this might show up is if you, they've done sort of these experiments where they'll go to a third grade classroom and they'll introduce sort of a subject like nuclear war or environmental destruction or something like that. And, and you can spot the gifted children because they react in a very different way. And what ends up happening is that they, they have the intellectual ability to sort of recognize the gravity of what they're hearing, but they, they don't have sort of the, the emotional maturity to really kind of put it in perspective and, and deal with it in a way that, that adults learn how to. But, but they're so sort of th this profile of kind of emotional immaturity but superior intelligence uh, makes them so different from their peers that one of the things Lita Hollingworth found is if you have, th th there are sort of these ordinary leadership patterns that tend to emerge when you put children generally in groups with each other. But those kind of basic patterns just don't even emerge uh, when gifted children are in the presence of, of peers who have an IQ of, 30 points or more, or more below theirs. They have actually an unusually high uh, tendency to feel empathy. I mean, this is actually one of the really sort of dynamic and interesting areas where there's research being done. And, and I, I mean, this sort of a very early, the, the research is in a very early stage, but some scholars think, and I, I'm inclined to think that you probably can detect intelligence sort of within infancy. And I think one of the things that may account for sort of why gifted kids become gifted beyond whatever sort of IQ they're inheriting, maybe just increased sensitivity to environmental stimulus of any sorts. And so like in the, in the case of something like hearing about nuclear war or uh, environmental destruction or something, what I, what I suspect is happening is two things, that one, because of their sort of higher IQ, they just, they can kind of reason at different orders of complexity and so they, they may, for example, be able to foresee kind of the consequences of what they're hearing in a way that sort of even many uh, adults of average intelligence cannot necessarily grasp. But then the other side of it is this intense emotional experience where they can sort of, they can feel kind of the, the implications of this. So, so that may, one of the ways that may manifest profound sympathy for, for victims or whatever else. But, but what they don't have is sort of the, like if an adult hears about kind of tragedy in the world or, or you know, something like that, they, they're probably likely, compared to other adults, to have react differently emotionally. But also, you know, part of the process of maturity is just sort of living with, with risk and tragedy and so forth. When I say sort of this combination of immat emotional immaturity and superior intelligence, I, I probably should have worded that differently. It's not that gifted kids are immature, it's just that there's sort of a, a very big gap between their emotional maturity, which tends to be sort of age appropriate or maybe even a little bit more mature than their peers. It's just that their kind of intellect and their IQ and their intelligence is so much superior that, that the emotional side doesn't keep up with the, the intellectual side. And then finally, the sort of two generalizations was on life outcomes. Uh, with gifted children, and uh, one is that uh, gifted children are just far more likely to achieve professional success later in life. Um, in a recent longitudinal study, children who are identified with IQs of 160 or above at age 12 were more likely by age 40 to earn doctorates, academic tenure, patents, high-level leadership positions, and 
major organizations. And, and one of the things that I found really fascinating is uh, that there's sort of this notion that uh, there's an ability threshold and that above a certain level of intelligence, more intelligence just doesn't really add value. And that seems not to be the case among uh, gifted children, which say that sort of recent studies have shown that when children score in the top 0.01% of intellectual ability in middle age, in adolescence, their achievements in middle age are considerably higher than those even in the top 1%, to the point that scholars basically are now saying that kids in the 0.01% are actually on a whole different developmental trajectory than people in the top 1%. So for example, people who, children who score on the top 0.01% are more likely than others in the top 1% to be vice presidents of major corporations, lawyers at prestigious firms, finance professionals, tenured faculty at research universities, STEM leaders, etc. Yeah, so I mean, one of the questions is sort of these, these kind of emotional vulnerabilities and these emotional issues that you kind of see among gifted children. I mean, are, there, there's sort of this debate, which is, is it inherent in giftedness? Is, is this just sort of part of the package? Or is it sort of a symptom of the fact that gifted children are, are socialized like kind of in a society where they really don't have peers, uh, which say that the people at their kind of at the same level cognitively are a handful of adults, um, but, but they're basically not really around other children of, of kind of their same emotional profile and, and that makes them feel constantly different, uh, alienated, foreign, etc. And I don't, I don't really know. I mean, I could, I could kind of make the argument for both theories. Um, I suppose, I mean, one of the things I found is programs, the Duke one, the Hopkins, and I think there are a few others, but the, the Duke and Hopkins ones are the main ones, that the, uh, some of the greatest beneficiaries of these programs are basically like when they identify sort of small, uh, the very small number of high IQ kids in certain like rural areas or whatever who just aren't really in uh, areas that tend to have a high percentage of gifted kids and when they're introduced in a setting that where they're finally around kids of, of their sort of intellectual ability that they really you see kind of new bouts of energy and dynamism in them so that may lend that kind of anecdote may lend itself more to sort of the environmental explanation for uh, uh, gifted children's emotional profile, but I, I think there may be something too also to the fact that they may just have a bi certain biological wiring that makes them more sensitive to environmental stimulus uh, generally. I mean, the, the one that surprised me was this ability threshold. I, you know, I, I did expect a gap between kind of gradients within the 1%, but, but it is pretty remarkable how um, a tenth of a uh, percent at age 12 or 13 there's a guy uh, at Duke named Jonathan Way who's starting to do a lot of these studies. So he, he'll look at these like very exceptional forms of achievement like billionaires in finance or kind of U.S. senators among politicians and, and kind of compare, uh, see if they can find, track these people, what, what their IQ might have been uh, measured in when they were in middle school and, and so forth. So I, I don't exactly know what the what it is, and there's always going to be this question of just sample size. In terms of how to test for whether intelligence is hereditary or not, basically the way those studies are done is uh, by studies of separated twins. So I mean they're not they're not perfect, but but that's sort of how they at least come close to controlling for factors uh, for environment. Now, in terms of this, these sort of longitudinal studies of where they compare sort of the 0.01% to the 1% and track them into middle age, uh, are they controlling for other factors like uh, parent socioeconomic status and whatnot? Uh, I think the answer is basically no, they're not. I'm kind of conflicted on it too. I mean, I, on the one hand, I would think that it, it potentially could make a, a difference because when you're, when you're looking at a small advantage that appears sort of very early in childhood, maybe even at birth, and you consider sort of how even a very small uh, advantage in IQ can compound over years and years and years. Um, I wonder, it, it could be sort of like putting in an extra half an hour of practice every day or something. I mean, it, it, it may not be significant in the short term, but it's something that could accrue. And, and 
you know, maybe maybe added to that argument might be that IQ is correlated with so many other positive things in life, uh, everything from health to you know, ability to weigh risk or whatnot. So, so that would be kind of the argument in favor of thinking that it would matter. But on the other hand, sure, I, I think you're right that, I mean, if you have sort of parents who are wealthier or parents who are, have a higher socioeconomic status, maybe sort of that difference between 1% IQ and a 0.01% IQ is really reflecting sort of different forms of I don't know, environmental stimulus or privilege of various sorts. I mean, what, one, maybe I can shed a little bit of light. I'm right now working on a piece on uh, looking at the origins of Nobel Prize winners in science. Well, so one thing that's sort of very well established is that firstborn uh, are, are much more likely to win the Nobel Prize in science than younger siblings. One of the reasons people think is because sort of there is, firstborns have, tend to have an IQ about three points higher than second sons, and researchers basically say that that is enough of a difference, a three-point gap, uh, to have sort of a high B average in school versus a low A, um, which, which they say the cumulative effect of that is basically the difference between admission into an elite school versus a, an elite private school versus a, a public one. But then at the same time, if you look at sort of the IQs of Nobel Prize winners in science, there's a very wide uh, spectrum where you have on the one hand sort of someone like Linus Pauling, who won two Nobel Prizes in science. He's rumored to have an IQ around 170. But then on the other end, you have uh, sort of people who have scored in the high 120. But the reason they're in the 120s is because their quantitative skills are just very, very high, but their verbal skills are, are relatively average. So I don't know. I, I, think, that's, I think that's just an unknown. Well, there, there's wide debate on the precise percentage to which uh, IQ is genetic. I mean, really, the only thing that there is consensus on is that some percentage of it is genetic, and you have experts basically saying anywhere from 20, 30 percent to 80 percent. I mean, that, that's how wide uh, the debate is. Now, in terms of why firstborns might have a three-point higher difference, I don't know. I mean, I, I think you could make both a hereditary or an environmental case. I mean, certainly the environmental circumstances are very different from a firstborn in terms of the amount of parental and undivided parental attention they're getting. Um, but you could maybe make a biological argument, too. I mean, if you have firstborns are obviously being born to younger parents, so they may be benefiting from just healthier parents, maybe fathers with better sperm quality, Etc. Or maybe parents are just sort of more inclined to take precautions before having their first kid compared to the other. I'm inclined to think it's probably more environmental, but I but I, I don't discount the genetic factor too, especially if we're talking about three points, which I mean, any number of things could could make that much of a, a difference. Yeah, I mean it seems intuitive to me that if you're looking at like achievement in theoretical physics or, or math or something, but I mean, absolutely having an, high IQ, uh, an IQ sort of in the 160, 170, 180 range does get you something that an IQ in the 120s or 130s doesn't. I think the trickier question is something like a vice president at a corporation or a partner at a law firm or something like that. I mean, I, I could even actually see someone sort of in the 130 range being at an advantage over someone who's two standards deviations above that. Uh, so uh, that's sort of my intuition on that. But, but the point I was going to make is that, you know, that, that may be true for reasons that actually are not related to ability, which is to say that it may, it may be, and I, I, I'm inclined to think this, that someone maybe with a 170 or 180 IQ may actually be a better lawyer or may actually be sort of a, a better kind of technocratic manager or something, but the reason they may not, may be at a disadvantage is not because of their ability, but just because there are so few people. Right, but, but the question would be sort of if we had a society with a much higher uh, average IQ and a much larger number of people, sort of, so in other words, let's say we were living in a society where the average white IQ wasn't 105 or 107 or whatever it is, but sort of 120 was the average, and then you had a, a very high number of people in the 130 range, and then also sort of a, a significant number of people in the 170 range, would it still be the case that people in the 130 range were at an advantage by virtue of their sort of other, their non-cognitive abilities, or would it be the case that people in the 170 range would have more peers 
uh, to whom, with whom they could relate and socialize and whatever. There was a, um, a case study in one of the, the Hollingworth uh, case reports. I, I think this may have been in the 180 plus range, but it, actually I, I don't think it was. But um, I mean, they, they had this sort of preschool kid who would, he was in sort of this normal preschool and, and they hadn't identified him as being uh, gifted. And whenever the teacher would kind of corral all the kids together, he would, this kid would wander off and lie on the floor and stare at the ceiling and no one knew what was going on. And so they sent the kid to be tested and it turned out he had an IQ like in the 170 range. And, and when Hollingworth asked him what he was doing when he kind of wandered off alone, he said that he would, he would be doing math problems in his head or kind of floating off into an imaginary world. And so, I mean, to me, that anecdote kind of raised this question of if you are seeing people in that IQ range yet sort of behaving in, in odd ways or not relating to mainstream society, I mean, is it because their brain is just operating in this kind of different world at, a, at just such a higher level of abstraction that it almost by definition removes them from more sensory functions or whatnot? Or sort of would a kid like that who's behaving that way in this particular case, would he, would he in fact kind of develop more normal social skills if all his peers were a little bit closer in terms of his uh, intellectual ability? I mean, basically, this research kind of in the 1920s and 30s, even though it was in a relatively early stage, it actually ended up being kind of really the, the apex of research in this area, uh, largely for political reasons. One of the reasons was that a lot of the people who were really drawn to this research, uh, Lewis Terman being kind of a, a notable, notable example, were eugenicists. Uh, and they, had, they were quite outspoken about it and advocated uh, sort of a whole political agenda to go along with their, their kind of scientific uh, and, and psychological theories. And as eugenics fell out of fashion, not only were, were people like Terman and others kind of in a delicate situation politically and academically, but more generally the sort of aspiration to help gifted children became sort of likened to uh, kind of the, the eugenic excesses of, of the Nazis and whatever else. And um, so you had this sort of backlash in the 1940s against this field of gifted and talented education. And then in the 50s, you had this very brief kind of rekindling of uh, gifted and talented education in the context of U.S.-Soviet rivalries. Um, although even there, I mean, the, the emphasis was never quite on this very top level or top echelon. It was more sort of interested in promoting kind of math and science research. And so they were looking at kind of paying more attention to the sort of top five or top two or top one percent. Uh, but nevertheless, I mean, this was, at least in retrospect, actually, it's quite interesting that if you, I went back and looked at sort of what advocates of gifted children were writing in the 1950s, and their complaint was that this emphasis on science and math and whatnot in the context of the Cold War and Soviet rivalries um, we're not doing enough for the kids at the very top. But with the benefit of hindsight and in retrospect, uh, this period in the 1950s and early 1960s was sort of a, a relative renaissance for a gifted and talented education. But that sort of rekindling of interest, again, uh, faced an even greater backlash uh, by the late 60s, uh, largely on as the civil rights movement took off, gifted and, and talented education really kind of faced another backlash. And I think we're, we're basically in that period uh, even today. A quote that I, I had in the article was by Peg Tyree, uh, who, who's looked at this issue. And she said that programs for intellectually talented uh, youth today are, quote, spurned by equity-minded school administrators and policymakers who see them as means by which predominantly affluent white and Asian parents have funneled scarce public resources or public dollars toward additional enrichment for their already enriched children. So what, what you basically saw is sort of as the civil rights movement took off in the late 60s and sort of really took hold uh, into the 70s, programs and enrichment for gifted children basically um, became more and more rare uh, within mainstream institutions. And you had, beginning in the late 1970s, uh, this, this sort of programs for gifted children really moving outside of the mainstream and into private institutions. 
there was a big court case in the late 70s uh, where a couple, uh, both of whom had PhDs in, in science, wanted to homeschool their kids in Massachusetts and uh, sort of got into this protracted legal uh, uh, situation, and they ended up winning uh, in the end, but it was sort of a, a significant case and, and highlighted that there was a sort of new wave of homeschoolers coming up that were not religious in nature, but more just doing it for on, on grounds of, of gifted and talented education. Uh, and that's also a trend that's continued. Uh, you, you've seen since the late 70s, uh, really since the 80s, um, a very precipitous rise in the number of people homeschooling, not for sort of ideological reasons, but more for sort of the lack of, of resources for gifted and, and talented education. The dearth of, of programs and whatnot for gifted and talented education in public schools and other mainstream institutions so became so bad that you've seen really this flourishing in the private sector of different avenues and resources. Um, one of the things that I was uh, quite surprised by is even though you keep seeing year after year the U.S. in general standings going down in international, in terms of basic international competency with math and science, in these elite international math competitions, uh, for the last two decades they've been dominated by uh, Chinese, Russian, and South Korean students, but American students have started to prevail again after a two-decade drought. And the reason basically is due to these kind of private enrichment math ca camps entirely in the private sector that are now really flourishing in um, sort of coastal cities and, and tech meccas and whatnot. And they're, uh, again, allowing American students to, to win these competitions. I, I quoted in the article, uh, there's a woman by the name of Linda Gottfriedson, who's really an expert in this IQ gifted children space. And her basic argument is that sort of the reason why gifted children are so controversial and the reason why gifted and talented education remain, remains such a dicey subject is because uh, gifted children, quote, epitomize our ambivalence over talent. Um, the natively gift, they are the natively gifted who remind us starkly that we are not all equally capable no matter how many hours we study or practice. The argument that I sort of made in the piece, and I'm, I'm curious what you think, is that I, I think Gottfriedson is on to something, and I think there is sort of this kind of inherent tension in any democratic society, but I guess the pushback I would have to that line of thinking uh, is that if you look at other democracies, or, or at least countries that are relatively free, uh, South Korea being a notable example, uh, you really don't have the same sort of uh, controversy over gifted and talented education. You, you don't really see it in Japan either, Singapore, uh, you don't. The, the question is why, and I, and I think a lot of it has to do with a uniquely uh, anti-intellectual uh, and egalitarian streak that, within the U.S., and, and one where a whole variety of, of cultural factors, which I, I get into in more detail, uh, are really sort of conspiring to make it kind of a problematic situation for gifted and talented education. One of the, the polls that I found really astonishing, um, a joint uh, a, a 2011 survey done by today.com and parenting.com found that 45% of American mothers admitted uh, that they would, quote, choose to weigh 15 pounds less rather than add 15 points to their child's IQ. I mean, that, that to me suggests sort of any number of problems happening in society. I think one is obviously a, an unhealthy sort of streak of anti-intellectualism. Another obviously is sort of a, the vanity associated with weight and whatever. But I think a lot of it probably just has to do with the fact that the vast majority of uh, people, even people who are educated and care about their kids, actually really have no sense uh, whatsoever of, of what a 15-point IQ difference really means. Um, and, and there's sort of a whole other line of questions there as to why, as a society, we're, we're relatively ignorant about, about what IQ is, what it measures, and how much it matters. Well, on this question of sort of how much it's hardwired, I mean, one of the, the points that I made uh, in that C-SPAN interview was that um, it does seem to be relatively difficult to uh, raise a, a child's IQ beyond what they're sort of born with. I mean, it can be done, but there are a lot of uh, things that have to happen. But, but it is very easy to uh, diminish or destroy uh, a, 
a child's IQ. I mean, I, I list some of the things that are correlated with IQ reductions, um, junk food, sedentariness, uh, television, sports and athletic injuries. I mean, there, there are all sorts of these things. And one of the reasons why I'm not, I don't think that IQ really is as determinative as, as some people think, is that I think if you, if, if parents even took very basic precautions to, pre to preserve and protect a child's baseline level of IQ, I mean, that, that alone would, would give their kids an enormous advantage. But again, I mean, maybe that goes to the ignorance point that I, I think, I think you're probably right that IQ feels very real, or sorry, weight uh, feels very re real compared to something more abstract than the IQ. But insofar as people do think about IQ, maybe they, they think that it's a more fixed uh, number than it in fact is. I mean, other factors that are sort of li linked with reductions in IQ, um, neurotoxins like fluoride, lead, indoor mold. I'd be curious, actually, if related to that, if you were to, there's obviously the sort of debate within the scientific literature. I'd be curious if you polled Americans both sort of in a general survey, and then again, uh, looking at American elites, what popular conceptions are of exactly how much IQ can be manipulated. Um, my own hunch is actually that the, the lower uh, estimates are probably more correct, because they're really not sort of accounting for uh, how much you really can improve or protect uh, a child's IQ if you're really focused on it as a as an end goal, which I imagine is not the case with the vast majority of, of kids who are studied in these twin surveys. So I'm, I mean, I'm inclined more toward the 20, 30, maybe 40 percent number than the 70, 80 one. I think a lot of people have read the, read the article on gifted and talented education and, it, and sort of read it as a call for a, a very intensive style of parenting and cultivation for for people, or for children who are high IQ. Whereas I kind of had the opposite intuition, but I think if you look at the, the profile of who these gifted children are, um, I think what they actually need more than anything is a wide degree of autonomy and freedom. And obviously they need encouragement, they need uh, material provision, they need opportunities, et cetera. Um, but it seems that unprecedented levels of supervision and control uh, over children's lives and, and this is a trend uh, sort of for, for reasons I don't entirely understand that really took off in the early 80s where you have this uh, very precipitous kind of rise in the amount of uh, stringent adult control that, that sort of defines American childhood today. Um, I had a few numbers to illustrate these trends. Um, the amount of free time that school-age children had in the early 80s uh, uh, went from 40% to 25% by the mid-90s. Uh, the time young children spend in school jumped from five to six hours in the early 80s compared to seven hours in the early 2000s. And by 2006, you have about 40% of schools that had either eliminated recess altogether or were considering doing so. And um, all this sort of amounts to what Kind of researchers are calling a, a radical change in, in kindergarten where things like exploration, exercise, imagination, play are all being de-emphasized in favor of uh, lengthy lessons, very highly prescriptive curricula, state standards, standardized testing, and uh, teachers with, with relatively little autonomy. Yeah, I mean, it's a trend that has sort of picked up since the early 80s. Now, compared to when I mean, obviously there was a point sort of not too long ago where even this, this kind of norm of everyone going to school for, for full-time schedules was um, uh, not the case. But I guess I'm talking about it in terms of things like the amount of time kids are playing uh, outside without kind of uh, supervised classes or formal classes. Yeah, I mean, so some of the explanations that have been kind of thrown out there to to try to explain why why there's been this sort of trend since the early 80s. It's um, parental fear kind of in reaction to the crime wave of the 70s, um, uh, greater reliance on therapeutic techniques and sort of a tendency to interpret kind of ordinary problems being psychological in nature, um, different environmental impacts on, on hormonal levels, 
uh, problematic parent-child relationships that are foster fostering different forms of anxiety, um, patterns in commercial development, which just sort of limit the number of opportunities for, for unstructured play. Um, one measure of this is sort of a decline in the number of public sandboxes and that sort of thing. Uh, anxiety over college admissions. Uh, so I don't, I don't think anyone really knows what's going on. I mean, I, I suspect one of the things actually just may be sort of migration patterns and, and relative kind of, I mean, I, I'm not sure, but I suspect that maybe if you have less homogenous uh, neighborhoods, that might sort of diminish a sense of community and people may be more or less inclined to have their kids go out and play or make friends with other uh, kids. I mean, I, I, don't know, I don't know, but I guess in the context of the gifted children uh, discussion, my sense is that this is, that this is probably a, a problematic situation that's happening, if my theory is correct, that what gifted children really need is more autonomy and, and uh, liberty to pursue their own interests rather than sort of a, a great deal of parental supervision. Yeah, I, I came across a number of, of interesting sort of findings on that. Um, one thing is that in this field of gifted and talented education, there pretty much is a consensus among researchers that uh, acceleration uh, does work to the benefit of, of gifted children. Uh, and the reason why acceleration is controversial, it has very little to do with outcomes for gifted children themselves. It's usually deriving more from kind of egalitarian concerns or, or sort of the idea that either by removing the smart kids and letting them sort of skip grades and whatnot, you're somehow depriving the other kids or alternatively, people are just sort of concerned that um, uh, gifted kids, whatever their IQ, are not emotionally able to handle uh, higher levels of classes. But, but most of the research suggests that acceleration is a good thing for high IQ kids. And, and one of the things, ironically enough, um, one of the greatest, most democratically accessible resources for gifted children are actually community colleges um, where sort of their you know, parents can just kind of sign their kids up for, for classes. They're in a college environment. Uh, no one's really asking questions. You, you go and, and show up. And, and um, when you see these kind of cases of, of kids kind of graduating uh, from high school or college very early, it's usually that they've made use of the community college system. So I suppose that would be one area for, for the state. Um, but you know, overall, I, the conclusion I reached is really that uh, they're just, I kind of moved in a libertarian direction on this. I just don't see a lot of opportunity for state intervention that at a practical level is going to be effective. Uh, what, one, of the, one of the things that I found quite shocking, uh, after I wrote the piece, this woman uh, called me who, who works with gifted ch kids in the uh, suburbs of Boston, and I thought if there's any kind of place or hub in American society where, where gifted and talented education would be flourishing, it would be sort of in, this, in these suburbs where you have sort of uh, the children of professors and uh, whoever else. And, and she was saying that in many ways it's even worse there because what ends up happening is when you go to these uh, elite kind of schools in Newton or Cambridge or, or Wellesley or wherever, um, and, you, and you draw attention to these high IQ kids who are sort of in the 150, 160, 170 range, and you, and you kind of make the argument that they need special cultivation or enrichment or nourishment, you actually face very strong, uh, uh, these kids actually face very strong pushback from the parents in these schools where you know, most of their kids are sort of in the 120, 130 range. And so they're obviously doing very well in the school. They have parents who care, uh, et cetera. And, and when they hear this idea that there's this group of kids who are so-called gifted, uh, even though it's sort of objectively their one standard deviation above even where these so-called, where, where these sort of genius level kids are, uh, in many ways they invite even greater pushback uh, in, in these sorts of areas. And um, I mean, this woman was saying that in her efforts to kind of explain what it's like for a kid sort of in this 150 and above range, uh, it's, there's just a total disconnect with the teachers, with other parents, with, with politicians, et cetera. Specialized schools that really cater to this uh, elite group of gifted children 
one, there just aren't that many of them, but two, insofar as they exist, you would think that they would be in places like Manhattan or Silicon Valley or Cambridge or whatever, and they aren't. Like the, the, the best school for the gifted children is in Las Vegas. Um, and, and like there's one sort of in uh, Louisiana that just kind of popped up recently after Hurricane Katrina, and you just have these like, very random places where these schools erupt so, uh, or emerge. If you have gifted children being uh, born primarily to upper class or wealthy and educated parents, um, I think if you if we had more tax cuts, if we had smaller governments, and you gave these parents just more discretionary income and autonomy and so forth to invest uh, in their kids, I think more than anything that that's probably where uh, public policy interventions are going to have the greatest benefit.